welcome to the Brock Interview Series with host Thomas S. Orwatt Jr. Welcome to episode number 98 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwatt Jr. It is March 19th, 2024. And for this feature, I have guitar virtuoso Yuli John Roth as my guest. During this interview, Yuli talks about his upcoming North American tour, his new book entitled The Search of Alpha Law, his time as a member of the Scorpions from 1973 to 1978, and much more. So here he is, Yuli John Roth. Hey everyone, welcome to the Rock Interview Series, and today we have a great special. We have guitar legend Yuli John Roth with us today. Yuli, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I guess we should get right to it. You announced a tour of North America, and it's called the um, Interstellar Sky Guitar World Tour, and it kicks off on April 2nd in uh, Mesa, Arizona. Yuli, what led you to decide to tour North America at this time? Well, um, it's touring North America has been uh, like a thing that I've been doing for many years, you know, um, on a regular basis, uh, because I love doing that. And, and we've got a lot of audience over there in your uh, in that neck of the woods. Um, but uh, we haven't been since uh, before COVID. And um, so we had this, we had a 70 date tour booked for, for North America, including Canada, um, when COVID hit. And uh, so I did a few shows um, in Europe with a, uh, it was also called Interstellar Sky Guitar. It was a solo tour with just with a big screen orchestra behind me and, uh, you know, and I wrote a lot of music for it, new music. And then, um, yeah, thanks to COVID, there was no tour. So uh, forward to uh, 2024, I thought it would be good to pick up that thread. And, you know, a lot of people still have tickets from back then. Um, and they're, of course, fully valid. But uh, just... Um, I thought it might be a nice idea to not only bring the solo show, because after so many years, um, bring the band as well. So we're actually doing a duo kind of show, uh, two shows at one evening. I'm kicking off with one and a half hours of solo doing, a, a, which is called An Evening with Uli John Roth which includes um, uh, a little TED talk about my new book, uh, in search of the alpha law, um, which I'm I'm going to be presenting, and uh, then there's a, a break, and then we're playing a full on rock show, uh, you know, consisting of my earlier material, uh, Scorpions, Electric Sun, and and also a little bit of Jimi Hendrix, and that yeah, when, when... the evening, you know, when when I saw you in 2019 when you played in Buffalo. It was yeah. it was like a three hour long like epic like amazing show and uh you know three hours too yeah. yeah you you really give your fans their their money's worth when when they come and see you now you mentioned something about this TED talk and you also mentioned something about um a book in search of the Alpha Law uh tell us a little bit more about this TED talk and and when do you plan on releasing this book. Okay, um, the book will be released pretty much during the tour. So we're, we're not going to have it on the tour. We're a little late. Unfortunately, it was uh, quite complicated to get everything uh, under wraps, but we're going to have it. So I think uh, what they're going to do at the merch, they're going to sell vouchers, you know, <laughs> so 10, 10 or $20 vouchers for the book, and then people will be sent the book. Which is a good idea anyways, because you don't want to carry that book around you in the evening. <laughs> Let me just show you how, how big it is. I've got it right here. And it's quite a tome, you know. <laughs> it's that big and uh, heavy, like in, I don't know, in stone, but it's uh, four kilos. Get 600 pages. 
um, and with uh, about a thousand pictures and illustrations. Uh, I did all the design myself because I wanted it to also be uh, artistic, you know, and uh, I wanted the text to be one with all the imagery. And uh, the way this came about was um, thanks to COVID actually, you know, I'm one of the few people who actually, I guess, can be thankful to COVID because it was a horrible thing for most people. Um, I was able to spend two years in lockdown writing this book. And this book uh, has quite a history uh, because I started many years ago writing it. I wrote several versions. I was never quite happy because um, uh, I wasn't quite sure how to present the book, you know? So the subject matter is, is not an easy subject matter. It's quite uh, philosophical. It's about my view of life and um, music has a lot to do with it, you know? And I wanted to have a book that also non-musicians can enjoy. And, and that's not so easy when you're sometimes talking about technical stuff like octaves and fourths, et cetera. You know, how, you, how do you explain that, you know, to somebody who doesn't know what an octave is? So to cut a long story short, uh, when COVID came and I was at home with all this time, the book just started to pour out and it kind of wrote itself, you know. And the subject matter really goes back like 40 years um, because I've been always fascinated by these ideas uh, that are, um, you know, uh, described in the book, you know. And um, yeah, that, that's basically it. It's difficult, difficult to explain the book in a few words. Um, that's why it's a book and that's why it's big. It's got a lot of facets and it's a little bit, I, I, I scripted it a little bit like a movie, you know, so there are many different facets and, and, uh, and, and various storylines, which, um, you know, which sometimes drift side by side and then they, they gel together. So that's it. What did you find the most challenging part about writing that book? Besides the fact that it's so big and it's the bigness wasn't really the challenge. I could have written a much bigger book. My original intention back uh, many years when I first started uh, to do Sky Academy in Los Angeles was to write seven books because uh, it was like a complete kind of philosophical system in itself, kind of. Um, but I went away from that and I, I thought I make it more user friendly. I didn't want a dry something. I wanted something that can touch people that's inspirational rather than academic. And once I figured that out, it kind of started writing itself, you know, and um yeah, the, the obstacles, there, there were really no obstacles. It was just uh, well, I did have to learn uh, about book design. That's something that I didn't know before how to do that. So um, I wouldn't say I mastered that craft, but I, I got by, you know, in order to do what I wanted to do. And now I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. And it's a good foundation for my Sky Academy also, um, you know, Whereas before, when we did these Sky Academy uh, seminars, I never really had anything in writing, you know, and now I do. Uh, this ties in very much with my musical output, my musical philosophy. Having said that, even uh, we are actually, this book comes with a couple of bonus CDs because I thought it might be nice to bundle it with actual music, not just the visuals. And of all my output, the stuff that uh, I figured was best for this was uh, my Metamorphosis album, which is Vivaldi's Four Seasons with electric guitar and orchestra and a concerto of my own 
Metamorphosis Concerto. So that's going to be in here as a um, as a new um, newly remastered release, and also half an hour's uh, piano music, which I wrote in uh, the early '90s, called Aquila Suite, which isn't so well known, but that will also go very well with this book, you know. And they're just uh, other creative angles. So that that's it, you know. Wow, that's going to be amazing! Not only the book, but music as well. I mean, that's I mean, take my money now. Yeah, well, there is uh, there's more than music in here, but uh, there is a lot about music and uh, the way uh, music really um, can shape our minds and music like songs. They might do that as well. Now, uh, even just the single chords, single notes, even, you know, there's some tremendous power in, in these. And this book has a lot to do with also um, going to the foundations of music, just single notes. And what is how does an, a note A affect us? Uh, in a different way than say a G and what happens when they come together, you know, there it's like two force fields um, and how do they interact and what happens in us and why is that, you know, uh, these are questions that I find very, very interesting among many other things. <laughs> yeah. In addition to your tour, you also, before the shows, are offering a guitar masterclass called The, S the Sky is the Limit Guitar Masterclass. Um, would you be able to take like a, a, a very average guitar player like me, and if I go to that, am I going to be like much better? <laughs> well, that is a, a tall order. Um, what I can do in my masterclass is show you ways to get better. Of course, I'm going to demonstrate certain techniques, you know, yes, uh, how to best do certain arpeggios, you know, and my way of approaching uh, certain things technically, but there's more to that. Um, the guitar players come in uh, all sorts of different levels. Everybody is at his or her own level and no two guitar players are alike, you know. So you cannot, uh, I I cannot give like random uh, advice to everybody, but there are certain things I think that uh, a lot of uh, players uh, and a lot of people who want to play the guitar that they could benefit from that they maybe don't quite realize. Um, a lot of people, um, how shall I say, have a lot of blockages in themselves, in their minds, and it's these that hold them back. You know, I learned very early on, I realized that these blockages are not a good thing. And I learned to completely empty my mind and forget about everything and be 100% in the music and literally just become the note to the point where you don't exist anymore. Once you're at that stage, music becomes very easy. And um, and you can also master technically difficult things because it's not in the fingers. The fingers, of course, are the faithful servants of the idea, but it's your mind more than anything. You know, once you, you uh, have um, understood things in the mind, you will find a way to translate it into the fingers, you know? And, a lot of people get too caught up in the the sheer technical minutiae. You know, a lot of that, I think, uh, can be dealt with instinctively once you um, understand the bigger picture. And once you see yourself as an instrument, which we are, I think, you know, and that's where it gets in the way because we're not just playing the guitar. We're really, I, I wouldn't say we're, playing ourselves, but it plays through us. And we shouldn't get in the way. You know, we should be uh, in a way also directing it, of course, but only to a point where we allow things to unfold. And it's it's difficult to just describe these things in a few words, you know. But uh, yeah, 
once you understand these principles, you can learn to get much better, much quicker with less practice. Sounds like a miracle cure, but it is. I mean, that's I've applied that all my life instinctively from the beginning, and that's uh, why I got where I, where I am now. You know, because I instinctively understood certain things and, um, and applied them, and that way, uh, you can do things with very, very little practice. You know, not that practicing is a bad thing; that you need to do your homework. You know, and when I was much younger, I did also a lot of practicing like like everybody i paid my dues um but then there comes a point where more and more the mental um thing is important you know and i mean to give you an example when the virus struck for some reason i didn't touch the guitar i didn't play for two years full stop i never touched it and i didn't need to i played some piano um, but I didn't play the guitar. And I thought that would be interesting to take a sabbatical. I didn't know it was going to be two years. Then we had a gig lined up. Suddenly I was, quote unquote, forced to play again, you know, because the gig was there. We had rehearsals in Hamburg. The gig was in Spain, I think. We had three days rehearsals. And even before the rehearsals, I thought, I'm not going to practice. Let's see what happens. You know, maybe I'm a sucker for danger or punishment. Certainly a sucker for certain amounts of danger. Um, and sure enough, uh, on the first rehearsal day, my fingers were bleeding. But my mind was actually able to do it. And then the second day it was a lot better. By the third day, it was almost there. Come the gig, which was, I think, a couple of days later, including flying or whatever, it was great. And I played, I mean, my guitar player, David, he said, well, you played better than before. And I thought so too, actually. It was very healthy to take this long sabbatical because it gave me such a fresh new outlook. A lot of people have to play every day to be happy campers, but... I'm not one of them. In fact, I, I don't like to play every day. Um, it's it's not for me. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, future plans to release a new record at any time? Well, That's you new... see, um, I have recorded a lot of stuff and I've written even much more stuff, particularly classical stuff for orchestras. Um, I'm not really a great fan of the recording process. So for me, it's always a bit of a struggle. Uh, but I have quite a few things ready almost for the mixing stage, you know. And releasing-wise, probably not going to be an album, but maybe blocks of three three pieces, which nowadays seems to be more the done thing, you know, the, the, the album uh, thing. It's almost may maybe a, a thing of the past. Um, I'm I'm not so sure. We we will see. You know, we will see. But I'm playing several of these pieces on this tour before they're even released. Oh, that's that's awesome! I can't wait to hear that. Um, I want to talk about the guitar that you uh, developed, the Sky guitar. I believe it was like I think I read that it was 1982 that you started working on that. And and it's a very un unique instrument, and um, it it has seven strings, correct? Uh, some have seven strings. Initially, uh, you're correct in in the in saying it was 1982. The actual idea came uh, in yeah just before um, New Year, New Year's Eve. Um, and then uh, the first guitar was built a few months later, first Sky guitar in 1983. Uh, originally, it was six string. Um, uh, a couple of years later, I had the idea to add a seven string because I wrote a, a challenging uh, orchestral piece called Sky Concerto, which I never recorded, but I finished the, the composition. And it kind of, there were certain runs in it that were really, um, you know, almost undoable on the sixth string. So I thought, how about if I have another string 
and sure enough, it made a big difference, you know, because you're suddenly able to, you know, uh, do arpeggios that the six string literally cannot do, you know. Um, yeah. So that's how that came about. And do you use that guitar exclusively every time you play? Or, or, yeah. Any yeah, yeah, I've played them for 40 years now. It's been exactly 40 years or 41 years now since the first Sky Guitar. Um, I haven't looked back. Uh, I am playing one which is called a Sky Strat. So that has a slight, uh, I play that occasionally. Um, it has, it's a Strat with extended fretboard and uh and my kind of pickup, which is called Mega Wing Pickup, which is all singing, all dancing, very powerful, very versatile uh, pickup system, active. Um, but on this tour, I'm bringing a whole bunch of Sky guitars. I bring some seven strings, my seven string Mighty Wing guitar, which is the one uh, that was the first ever seven string. I'm also bringing a seven string called Excalibur, which is slightly different. Then I'm bringing um, some six string ones and uh, a nine string nylon uh, flamenco sky guitar for which I wrote uh, some pieces and I will um, use that too in the first half of the show. Oh, I, I, like I said, I, I saw you in 2019 and I was just blown away. I really can't wait to to see this again and i'm so happy that you're playing in buffalo that's going to be a great day for us here for all music fans i want to ask is you a couple a excuse me is it a different venue in buffalo it is a different venue yes it's uh this one is like a um like a wedding banquet hall it which is very classy with chandeliers which i think it's going to be like perfect oh. for the type of music that you know you, you play um it's going to be nice because you know I'll be honest with you, as I get older, I like sitting down more now for concerts and standing up and, you know, yeah. getting crowded. Yeah, particularly for the first half of my show, uh, a seated audience is kind of a, a must, you know. It's not really a club show. The The rock part, yes, you know. But uh, the first half, it's people should sit and kick back, you know, and it's more like a cinema kind of thing, you know, with the screen... I prepared uh, a lot of movies for each song. There's like a corresponding uh, um, film in time with the music. And that's that's part of the experience, you know? And uh, yeah, so we're playing mainly seated venues almost exclusively, but uh, maybe, maybe a couple won't be. Again, when I saw you last time, I was like really impressed with the visuals. I felt like I was seeing like a theater show, like in a club and it was uh, like visually, it, it was really stimulating and, and your band was just amazing. You were amazing. Um, and, and being that close and, you know, being able to like walk right up to the stage and, and watch you play was quite the experience. So, you know, anybody watching this that, that hasn't, seen Yuli John Roth live before, make sure you definitely go because it's a hell of a show. Well, thank you. I mean, last time I think we did my uh, um, 50th anniversary tour and that's why it was three hours. We played all sorts of stuff. It was all with the band or most of it was with the band. I, I think I did play some uh, acoustic stuff in the middle, but this time, of course, it's even more diverse, you know? So, Yeah. I'm looking forward to it myself. It's quite a yeah. challenge because I will uh, be on stage a long time that day because if I figure the guitar seminar first, then we have like the three-hour shows and we've got meet and greets and all the usual kind of mayhem. Uh, I may be quite exhausted by the end of it and people may be quite sick of me. But that's, um, yeah, we're bringing... The Uli Circus to town. <laughs> yeah, I, I when I saw all that, all the activities scheduled for the day, I was wondering, you know, after a while, you're going to be like, just leave me alone, everybody. I just want to be by myself for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not really a leave me alone kind of guy, but um, I know it's going to be challenging uh, physically and mentally. And I have to really uh, time myself, you know. What I do in order to get through something like that is um, I always make sure that I get some 
a nap right before the show. That's like absolutely essential, you know, uh, to really, yeah, let my let all the uh, the spent energy move out and and let some energy come in. And I'm good with that. I'm like a cat. I can just drop, you know, dead and 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 soak it up and in no time at all recharge my batteries. And I think on you know in this um, on that tour I will have to do it several times. You know, luckily I've got my big tour bus outside and I've got my room in the tour bus, so I can just you know be a cat and uh, <laughs> hopefully be um, recharged for for it then. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Yuli, before we leave, I do want to ask you, of course, some questions about your time in the Scorpions. Yeah. Um, Mainly, when when you left, you you were in the Scorpions from 1973 to 1978, and um, you left after the tour encyclopedia for Taken by Force, which was released in 1977. Um, what was were, was there a lot of like pressure for you not to leave the band at that time, or or well, were you there, convinced yeah, there that was, you were... there was pressure in the sense that they didn't want me to leave you know we had a great thing going i mean the um the producer dira dirks said early you know uh, there's a saying don't ever um change a winning team you know and i knew what he meant you know i mean i had a great time in the scorpions i loved being there um, we were uh, a great team artistically, and uh, and we got on uh, splendidly as people. None of that was a problem. The problem was that I started to write material which I knew I shouldn't bring to the table. I started writing Earthquake, you know, 10-minute extravaganza um, <laughs> all singing, all dancing, semi-symphonic prog rock, you know, without vocals. That was not Scorpions at all, you know. Uh, and that wasn't the only one. They, lots of other ideas came which were absolutely not compatible with the Scorpions framework. And I knew it. And then I knew my time was up, you know. Uh, my main motivation was always of artistic nature and um i i saw the i mean it was clear the band was going to be massive you know we already had our first gold albums and stuff like that but i i just didn't didn't really have a choice you know i needed to do my thing because i i needed to go that journey that different artistic journey and the Scorpions saying, um, I had a lot of freedom there, but I didn't really feel artistically challenged anymore, you know? Um, although, I had I carried on, I guess I would have written more like Sales of Sharon, you know? I would have found a way to, to you know, contribute and, and to come up with stuff. But, um, yeah, my heart wasn't in it anymore. And, and that was that, you know? With was there ever a time where you wrote something and, and showed it to them and they said, no, I don't think we can use this because it's not, doesn't really fit our format. No, that never happened. Uh, first of all, I didn't show them these pieces because I knew it wouldn't fit, but Rudolph was always and Klaus. They were always super cool. They never, ever turned a single idea down that I came up with. Never, ever, you know, and uh, we never had a problem there. As I said, we were a great team, you know, uh, and there, there was harmony, you know. Uh, it happened that a couple of times I wasn't too keen on a couple of, of Rudolph songs, particularly also because of the lyrics, you know, like I wasn't so keen on Steam Rock Fever, for instance. It's a great commercial tune, but I really didn't want that. You know, that wasn't the style I wanted to go into. But that was just an artistic disagreement. And it, you know, um, it was no big deal. You know, um, there were never any hard feelings. Yeah. I, it was actually, I thought, quite fascinating and unusual. 
I remember five years in that band and I and there was not a single argument. And I mean argument where there was bitterness or a discord. It never happened. There were maybe some disagreements where I said, yeah, towards the end, oh, I don't like that song or I don't like that lyric. That happened, yeah? But we didn't have any discord, no arguments and, and bad feelings like in so many other bands, you have all these ego problems, you know, saying, oh, this song is mine. And, you know, we never had that. You know, I never thought about, oh, this is song is mine and I want to place my songs. And Rudolf was just the same and Klaus was the same. We always did what we thought was best for the band. And that was one of the reasons also why the Scorpions made it big because of that internal dynamic. You know, they were not at each other's throat. On the contrary, they were like a unity, you know, always. And that, and that was really good. If you were approached to write another song with them, would you do it? A song? Yeah, sure. Having said that, you know, uh, Rudolf and Klaus were the songwriting team, and I always wrote on my own. There were very few instances where we kind of mix it up. I certainly contributed a lot to Rudolph's songs, you know, um, structure-wise and comp and and theme-wise. I brought in themes and and melodies, etc. But um, but it wasn't like we were sitting down, you know, as as a songwriting team. Although that might be fun, you know. I mean, they're they're great, tremendous songwriters. And actually, nowadays, I yeah, I could I could see that. Yeah, we could probably come up with something really interesting. I would I'd love to hear that. Uh, my last question I have for you, uh, Yuli, is uh, Tokyo Tapes, which was, were you still in the band when that was released or did you leave prior to the release no, of that? I was already, when the release came, I had already left and I was already uh, kind of recording um, Earthquake. I recorded Earthquake in the same year as Tokyo Tapes, just a few months later. Uh, and I wasn't involved in the mix either, which I regretted because I was not really happy with the mix at all. But uh, that, that was my own fault. I could have been there. You know, I chose not to be. So there you go. I shouldn't complain. <laughs> what, what about the mix didn't you like? Because I think it's one of the best uh, live records ever. Yeah, that the music was, yes. But I remember what it sounded like on stage, and it was amazing um, in that hall, uh, San Plaza Hall. And I didn't quite hear that back on the album, you know? And I thought uh, certain things should have been mixed differently. But as I said, it's my own fault. Um, I chose not to be there. I did the Electric Sun thing. And with hindsight, I, I wish I would have been, been there for the mix, you know. But it's just one of these things, you know. Sometimes we make uh, um, wrong decisions, and I think that was a wrong decision. I should have been there to the end, seen that through that album, you know. And, Yeah. Like like in the seventies, there's there's a lot of live records that came out that weren't really truly live. So, I'm I'm assuming that they didn't try that to overdub any. Live. That one was live. Uh, I remember we did virtually no overdubbing there in the studio. Certainly, all my guitars were live. I remember that. Um, I think there was one thing that we tried to fix, and then it didn't work. I said, just leave it as it is. And um, I'm not sure about the vocals, if there were any fixes, but I don't remember any fixing any things. The one thing that was um, added was uh, audience applause in, in Japan. I think they forgot to put mics in the audience. So it sounded like really a little uh, subdued and Japanese audiences are always subdued anyways. You know, it's like... They do this and, that, and that's that, you know, and it's not that they don't like it. It's just the Japanese way of being polite. Um, but uh, to a Western uh, ear, that sounds almost like, wow, 
they didn't like it, you know. Anyways, so they did, um, uh, I think it was decided to um, put some, some extra applause into it just to make it feel a little bit more what, what it felt like, you know. Because, uh, yeah, it, it certainly felt we had a lot of applause, um, but uh, on the recordings, it didn't come through. And then that was the only thing that I remember that was being tweaked, really. Other than that, no, that's it was all live. Yeah. it's awesome. All right, Yuli. Well, thank you very much for your time. Looking forward to seeing you in Buffalo. Going to be a great, great show. Um, and I'm that book i can't wait to get my hands on that I, that is going to yeah, be well, amazing we'll have preview copies uh with us on tour you know you can you can have a look at it and and see how heavy it is <laughs> it really... looks like it weighs about 60 pounds uh it is heavy i tell you you know i mean if we were to carry that around in the tour bus you know just shipping wise oh boy that would be a problem you know yeah. so that, that's it okay well Thanks for having me and have a great time. And are you in Buffalo? I'm in Buffalo, in Buffalo? yep. Okay. All right. So I'm looking forward to being there again. Thank you very awesome. much. You're welcome. You take it easy, Lee. Bye-bye. And cheers.